Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> uh, my voice is already departing the earthly plane, uh, but hopefully I will be able to make it through this talk uh, and introduce the speakers that we have today, which is a wonderful lineup across a very broad area of intersections of IPFS and the web, what the web is, how you put IPFS in it, take IPFS out of it, put content on there, all of the different challenges that we have in getting ipfs -E things to work inside the HTTP web framework. So we're gonna see a bunch of that. Uh, my name is Dietrich Ayala. I've been working on IPFS things for four plus years probably, and then working on the web itself at Mozilla and Firefox for over a decade before that. Uh, I'm curating this track, and it's really a pleasure to have you here to talk about some of these challenges and learn about some of the amazing things that people are doing. Uh, I'm gonna kick things off by giving a short overview of the work that we do on my team at Protocol Labs. Uh, at this point, a, a, a small team of about two and a half people, and then a whole bunch of other organizations that we work with, uh, and uh, ho hopefully you will find it interesting, and maybe it will inform you about some of the challenges and we have in making uh, two paradigmatically different protocols function together inside uh, often hostile browser runtimes, which are not suited for the things that we want to do uh, with IPFS and, and transport agnostic application architectures. So this was the description about-ish that we published for what this track is going to be. Uh, I'm gonna kick it off with some of the things around the platform level, uh, work that we're doing, and then we'll follow it up with a number of different other talks. Uh, but first, the browsers, platforms, and standards team. Uh, so th this is a team right now. It's myself and Robin and David Justice, who's over there. And we work on a number of things across web standards, browser, uh, direct browser and web platform integration, working directly with browser vendors, uh, a number of different things around um, working with places that are maybe not even the web that we want IPFS to be. Uh, and then presence of IPFS and even not IPFS, but related technologies or things that are like mar far deeper in the stack where we need to have those technologies be available to choose in places like uh, web runtimes. Uh, so this is a, something I, I tweeted the other week when I realized that I wrote this up for an internal meeting. It actually wasn't like a secret meeting or anything like that. But it was one of those things where I was like, well, you know what, we do a whole bunch of stuff across a really vast area of a pretty small group of people that I should probably be sharing more proactively. So uh, we, one of the projects that you're gonna hear about at the end of the day is something that David is working on, uh, which is our team blog that's gonna be built IPFS from the ground up for us to dog food and also be able to communicate more proactively with all the folks that we think are probably uh, interested in this work and that we would like to have more participation in a lot of this work. Uh, some of these things are not things that we do directly, but that we aid uh, in, in happening, or where we shape an environment to be able to make some other decision by some other organization possible to be made. A lot of the browser vendor stuff ends up looking a lot like that. It's not quite puppet mastering, but more like uh, putting pieces in a room, uh, the feng shui of a room to be able to ensure that a decision can even be a possibility for uh, somebody in a HTTP world uh, around adoption of something that might be a little bit different. Um, and whether that's something like ED25519, uh, accelerating you know, the availability of things like that, or actually talking about how would you get something vaguely content addressy in something like a web, a web standard. Um, so one of the first ones is this initiative that we've had with a group called Little Bear Labs. Little Bear Labs has uh, been working on, I know, I know the founder from way back in Mozilla days, and uh, right now they're working on a few different projects. You may have seen them working on WebRTC transport for libp2p in Rust, uh, and I think JavaScript too. And they're also working on uh, the space program integration stuff that we're doing with Lockheed Martin. Uh, if you were here for the opening session yesterday, Ryan from Little Bear Labs spoke about that project and he's gonna speak in more depth about that architecture tomorrow. Uh, but an, another part of the Little Bear Labs and a project that we're doing is direct integration into Chromium. So the first IPFS, like real full IPFS node in browsers was in Brave about a year and a half, maybe two years ago, where they basically bundle Kubo and run it as an adjacent process, the same way that Brave does their Tor integration, where they have this like, IPC model between the browser itself. Uh, it's functional, it works, uh, it's, it's Kubo, so most of that stuff works the way that you would expect IPFS2 for the most part, uh, but it's not 
in the browser. It's browser adjacent. It's, it's next to it. It's not really part of the web either. Uh, the web being a server is one of the biggest blockers to acceptance of things like IPFS being in that traditional what we think of as a web platform. So the approach that we wanted to take when we thought about what native integration into Chromium would be, we had to kind of respect some of those boundaries in order to make small steps forward. And so the initial approach that we've done with Little Bear Labs is a multi-gateway client integration directly in Chromium. So imagine you type IPFS colon slash slash into the address bar of your Chromium-based browser and uh, with a CID there, under the covers, what this integration does is takes that CID, then uses the native Chromium network stack and makes requests to a number of different IPFS gateways, then verifies what it gets on the response from the first one of those and returns that content for the browser to render into the, into the viewport and the, the actual window that the user sees. Uh, this is kind of like a just glorified HTTP client, right? But the paradigmatic difference there is that you're getting the data from greater than one server or one HTTP origin, really. Uh, so in, in many ways, it respects the origin-based security model of the HTTP web, while also leveraging the, the HTTP accessibility of the IPFS network in a way that kind of, if you blur your eyes a little bit, is IPFS, can be content addressed, is verifiable on the client, uh, is actually multi, not, not quite peer-to-peer, -peer, but is multi-server in a very way that really differs from HTTP and can maybe be shaped in a way that could be shipped in an HTTP-only web browser. So really setting up all these pieces just right for the, I guess, the user experience of browser vendor decision-making uh, <laughs> in a way that hopefully will be uh, chipped in a couple of browsers this year. So um, there's going to be a blog post about this coming soon. All of this is already in a in public open repo, and we talk about it a lot in the browsers and platforms channel that is on Filecoin, Slack, Matrix, and IPFS Discord, super bridged across all of them. So if you're interested in this, hop in that conversation. Uh, there's really a lot, like this is a first take at what this architecture inside Chromium could be, but even inside, you know, start unbundling the entire massive universe of what Chromium is, there are more native -y ways to do it, and we expect that that's going to be the next major phase of the conversation that we're having with the Chromium community about how you might do something like this in a way that would be acceptable, safe, and fall within the bounds of what that community is reasonably willing to accept to land in tree and live natively in the Chromium code base. So qu quite an, an adventure, a very interesting opportunity there. Um, one of the other big things that is going to ship, I think, May 4th is a project that we've been working on. Again, Brave, one of the you know, earliest, biggest adopters of IPFS in the browser, is automatic pinning of NFTs in Brave. So when you have a Brave wallet, you can now add NFTs using your Brave wallet when you have those NFTs and those NFTs assets and metadata are stored somewhere else. Your NFTs are somewhat at risk at that point. You have a browser that supports IPFS. If there's IPFS addresses for your NFTs, maybe you want to be part of keeping those NFTs assets and metadata healthy and available on the IPFS web. So you have the opportunity as a Brave user that when you go and view your NFTs, it will basically have a little icon that says, would you like to keep these pinned? And you can click that button, it will enable IPFS inside Brave, and then start automatically pinning the NFTs that you have to your local IPFS node that Brave is running for you. The user experience is pretty solid and it integrates really well into how Brave visualizes and thinks about how you know, Web3, NFT, Wallet, all these features fit inside Brave. Uh, it, it, it's going to be a really nice experience. And one of the things that, you know, there's still a whole lot to figure out around long-term storage, uh, maybe remote storage options for these things. Uh, when you close your laptop, your IPFS node goes offline. Uh, so there's a bunch of other stuff to figure out. But as a first step of really letting people kind of own, own and serve their own data, this is a really nice alignment between in, uh, this and uh, the NFT features that they had and the availability of IPFS and users' ability to actually serve it and be a part of, of serving the broader NFT community is something that we're also thinking about. Like uh, some of the features we've talked about are what if the browser detected NFTs and pages auto and you wanted to be part of making sure that, say, your favorite NFT platforms, NFTs down online, you say, hey, uh, identify those NFTs, even though they're not in my wallet 
put them in my local IPFS node and be a part of making that data stay available. And you know, we're thinking about like, how do we visualize to a user, hey, uh, your NFT has six X of redundancy in, in pins across the IPFS network and things like that. So really interesting intersection of IPFS, lower level protocol and storage stuff, and really at the glass user experiences around data that people are having heavily invested and make sure that they wanna own and, and keep safe and keep available. Uh, one of the other integrations and uh, things that just shipped with with Brave and some more is coming is integration with uh, Brave and the FVM. So support for FVM addresses in the Brave wallet, and then we're looking at other types of things like DAP, deeper DAP integration and stuff like that. So uh, the initial wallet support FVM shipped uh, in April 4th, I think, in that release of Brave, and then we're going to see further wallet support come from there, and hopefully more uh, deeper features building on top of uh, this availability of dApps, your data, and even a local IPFS node and see, see what we can do with that. If you have ideas, please share. Lots of opportunity there. Um, one of the other things that our team does and the work that you might have heard Robin talk about this a little bit this, uh, yesterday morning was the IPFS and standards and the intersection of that work. How to make sure that the specs website, which is something that they shipped just a few weeks ago, uh, actually exists and is up to date and is usable as a reference for implementers like some of the people we have in this room. Um, and also thinking about what does it mean to be IPFS, which is still like, like this is something that Robin's going to talk about. He's Talked about a little bit about yesterday, and we're going to talk about some more today, or at least the grounding and like what does it mean vis-a-vis -vis the web and things like that. Um, but this is also some of the work that we do around trying to clarify this picture in a way that will result in a world where browser vendors and standards bodies can start to reason about what IPFS is, what are these component parts, what are the use cases it addresses, the values that it brings, and how that might fit into a, a future world in a, in a broader web standards way. Uh, we also do things in the browser extension space. So MetaMask has shipped MetaMask Flask, which is a uh, kind of like browserception plugin within a plugin within a plugin approach towards making MetaMask more scalable and extensible. They have a plugin system in the Filecoin Snap. This system is called Snaps. Was one of the first ones that shipped, and we've been working hand in hand with them to be able to make sure that when this branch of MetaMask goes mainline, that the Filecoin support is going to be up there and, and top class in the first set of plugins that they ship. Uh, so we do some work around making sure that the Filecoin Snap actually functions, that it works correctly, that we give feedback to them, that. Uh, uh, users like Glyph, which found like enabled an experimental version of this and found that Glyph's users uh, hopped right on. Like you, you can think that maybe MetaMask is not the ideal way of doing this thing, but what Glyph found out is that the user base is so large that as soon as they turn that on, the demand for it was immediate and loud. So they're already depending on this support being in there for the what they need to do with their products, and that helps all those MetaMask users get access to Filecoin and FVM. So uh, we're doing a little bit of work to both do end-to-end uh, -end testing and CI of this to make sure, like in that uh, stack of plugin within and a plugin within a plugin framework, making sure that as all these versions change and as Flask is changing, that we know when things break so we can get things fixed and up to date so that everything's ready to ship when it when that, when they turn that on and, and go mainline. Uh, one of the other things that we've been doing for a while is slowly but surely pushing on ED250519 support inside the web platform itself. So the web crypto API, currently those curves are not supported. Uh, we partnered with Agalia to be able to do that implementation. Agalia is a web consultancy. They've been doing uh, web development, like web platform development, actually changing web APIs with commit privileges and being part of the communities of WebKit, Gecko, and Chromium for 20, over 20 years, 21 years now. Uh, so they're very experienced. They know how to ride the rails of everything from uh, standards, conversations, to the implementations in each one of these different very large software projects and, and communities of these browser vendors. And... Uh, we're, we're almost there. Apple actually, WebKit ended up shipping some portion of it before anyone else, which is kind of like for us, one of these, one of these tests where, you know, we have this theory that when you, when you really engage each one of these communities directly, uh, thoughtfully, carefully and considerately, you can actually make changes to the web platform fairly rapidly if you kind of know how to do that. And you do it without coming in and, and making a big fuss and just being very thoughtful about what you need, why you need it, and how you're going to get there. Uh, and this is one of those things where we kind of saw that play out a little bit. And it looks like so far that we maybe within a period of, you know, our concerted efforts starting maybe late last year, within a period of 
hopefully less than one full year, we'll have all three of those rendering engines shipping it on by default. So that's kind of what we're pushing for and aiming for in this uh, weird little game of web platform chess. Uh, Durin is an application that we actually shipped to the iOS and Android app stores that David Justice and a group called, called Trigram uh, uh, built last year. And we haven't really made a lot of noise about it yet because we, it's more like an experimental vehicle for things that we can do that align mobile the best of what mobile platforms have to offer with the ability to share and use and consume content from the IPFS network. Uh, it's... Uh, we have a blog post, I think this hopefully will come out in the next week or two weeks. Uh, and the app is functional in a lot of ways now, and there's new features even coming, like it being a share target and things like that, that'll make it uh, easier and easier to be able to share to IPFS and read from IPFS using this application. The idea is that this application is easily forkable for other people to build IPFS features on top of. So not necessarily that we're going to own this as a you know top top tier product that we're going to support for a long period of time, but using this as a sandbox for testing different features. There's a bunch of things, other things we want to do, like like uh, native integration into the local contact store and things like that, uh, uh, automatically uploading all of your photos. Uh, we haven't figured out things like how do you do accounts and really looking forward to talking with uh, some of the folks here around how we could do account-like things where you could upload these off to a third-party pinning service and, and, and stuff like that. So uh, talk to David Justice if you're interested in learning more and you can install Durin today from the iOS and Android app stores. Uh, the larger, <laughs> the, the, I guess maybe a very much smaller set of people and decision makers, but with ramifications around those decisions that last for decades, is the adoption of multi-formats at the IETF. So uh, I, I, IPFS not being uh, a single company governs, governed set of technologies, protocols, standards, uh, is really important for the long-term adoption and for IPFS actually being part of the internet or the web. Some of the core parts of what make up content addresses are like the starting point for us to be able to really move these technologies into public governance. Uh, and the ITF is a natural fit for the components of IPFS at this level. So this has been a long conversation around whether or not multi-formats is really aligned and fitting for ITF governance. Uh, we actually got the thumbs up for that just in the last few weeks, maybe even a month ago. Uh, there are are always trade-offs uh, with working with uh, large multi-stakeholder governance groups. The ITF is very interesting in that it does govern a lot of the technologies that we kind of take for granted in the internet, but it's also not a membership organization. Anybody can show up and pay the ticket price three times a year and join these conversations, and a lot of people do. And when you look at the, at the videos from ITF and you watch, you know, they have these, like, like you, you basically... Uh, when you're proposing something like this, you get up in front of the group, and then the group lines up to ask questions, and it's... Um, it can be painful to watch. <laughs> and, uh, but a lot of these questions come, uh, while sometimes a little roughly asked, come from a really good place from a group of people who've been building the technologies that have resulted in, for good or ill, the internet that we have today, uh, and things that really need to like stand the test of time, decades and decades and decades. Uh, so, you know, Robin talked a little bit about yesterday about what robustness means and how we want to think about that differently. And that's the type of conversation that would be very interesting to have in terms of, in the context of adoption of these types of technologies at the ITF. That's one of the reasons why, why we're, we're pushing for that to happen there. So there'll be a lot more happening. Uh, this working group is just now starting to kick off probably over the next quarter or two. If you're interested in learning more and participating, again, just hop in the browsing platforms channel, we can put you in the right direction, or if you're already, ITF friendly, you will be able to know how to find these things. Uh, the, the, the instruction manual for participating in the ITF is long. Uh, you heard a little bit yesterday about the work that we're doing at Space. So Ryan from Little Bear Labs and we're the, my, my group helps coordinate this uh, whole project really about getting IPFS running inside of satellites, be able to communicate from satellite to satellite and also satellite to ground and back and forth and all the different permutations of ways you can do that. It's a very interesting time to be involved in space because there's so much civilian space activity happening. Growth is spectacular there and we're seeing people throw, you know, thousands of satellites up in space. So there is increasingly opportunities to address problems with open standards and open data and protocols that can be interoperable in this uh, oddly frenemy 
area of economic activity, technology adoption, and things flying through a vacuum at high speeds. Uh, the, find Ryan if you're interested in learning more. Uh, the repo that this is being done in is IPFS Shipyard in the space, and he's got a bunch of uh, demo videos and tests there. It's built in, in Rust and is designed to be able to talk to Kubo and hopefully before the, uh, hopefully before the end of this quarter, we'll kind of have an initial test result that will happen under controlled conditions um, with our partner, Lucky Martin, for the, an R&D launch that they're doing called the LM400 that we announced uh, I think late last year, earlier this year. And the, the uh, actual launch might happen hopefully this year, but as Ryan said yesterday in the opening session, uh, these are very long. A uh, product cycle is a weird way to think about it, but that's kind of what it is. Uh, and the product cycle for this particular, for, for the satellite, is, it could go into early next year, but we're hoping that it actually happens this year. But it's it's pretty exciting, and the interest that we're getting, you know, these have been very long conversations that happened over the last few years, and it's very interesting over time to be able to see the attitudes change. Like, at first, the, the space people were like, all right, you want to, you know, experiment with putting your thing on our thing and see if it talks to each other. That's cool, whatever. And then they, they have to kind of figure out how it works and learn more about it and learn more about content addressing. And as these conversations have gone on, they're now starting to come up with ideas of other areas outside this particular mission that they think, you know, that whole like immutable content addressing thing would come in really handy here. And also if we didn't have to care about the transport. So we're really seeing a, just a, an, almost an education of that market happen through these types of uh, experiments that, that we set up in collaborations that we do. It's really positive and hopefully that will result in a more interoperable uh, space. space. Um, so that, that's a, a quick speed run through the things that my team does and the, the browsers, platforms, and web-related stuff. Uh, sometimes it's the web as we know it today, and sometimes it's the web as we hope to know it in the future that we're working on. Um, but always jump in the browsers and platforms channel, Falcon Slack, uh, IPFS Matrix, and IPFS Discord. Uh, and there's us and an, a, a real cast of characters in there who are interested in these varying topics. But for the rest of today, we have a number of different talks. Let's see, am I, oh, I'm almost kind of mostly on time. Uh, in seven minutes, the next talk will be Robin Brejon, unless you would like to start early and then you get 30, 30 more, more minutes by the time I'm done. Uh, but uh, we have a, a great, great slew of talks today covering things from libp2p running inside web content to the new uh, JavaScript implementation called Helio IPFS. Uh, some interesting challenges around the infrastructure of the web, like how we do naming and what those, what, what, what that, what the intersection of naming and IPFS and DNS can be, and then. Uh, new toolkits and ways of thinking about how IPFS and content address data can be represented on the web. And then some other, uh, there's some other projects that are around the web publishing pipeline. So how do you take the content systems that you have today and, and publish both to the regular web and the IPFS web in a way that integrates and aligns with your tooling and your CI and things like that. Uh, all kinds of different things that we'll, that we'll see today. So please stick around. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask and reach out and I'll be here for the duration of the day. Uh, and now we have time for one question to start. Um, Dietrich, curious if the work on the browsers is also trickling down to mobile, like mobile version of browsers? Yeah, so the, uh, we have IPFS support inside Brave on Android and iOS already. Uh, Opera, iOS, and Android already have IPFS support for the addresses, and then it redirects that to a remote gateway, yeah, dweb.link right now. So that's available in, in those. The, Chromium uh, mobile and desktop code bases, there's, like, there's some, some thinking that needs to be done there about how that might work running on Chromium and mobile, and we haven't really got that far yet. Uh, what Durin is, is a native mobile application that is not necessarily a browser, but it does allow you to read and write IPFS content at this point. And one of the goals of that project is to use it as a sandbox to experiment with 
how things can work on mobile. And then um, we're also obviously talking, uh, our team keeps tabs on all the things that, that groups like Iro and also you know, Nabu being Java is also, and, and pretty low footprint, also really interesting opportunities for mobile as well. So uh, I think we're seeing some of the others, like we, we'll, I think we'll have uh, Filecoin support and Brave mobile wallet this year too. So not just IPFS, but also some of the other peripheral technologies that are, are around it that we want to ship as well. So lots of mobile stuff happening. Um, mobile browsers on IPFS right now, you have a couple of options for it, uh, but it's you know like a, it's a very simple integration that redirects to a gateway. And I think we, we are interested in seeing more sophisticated approaches towards towards IPFS and mobile. And that I think when you know projects like Iro and some of the other stuff that, that are focusing on on mobile uh, explicitly get a little farther along. That's what I think is um, that 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 is the the iOS and Android way of getting IPFS on the browser. Uh, Capiloon with Fabrice here is the total package where you have an entire operating system that is based on top of a web browser rendering engine, but is the operating system rendering of the home screen applications, everything itself, the application runtime. Uh, and Capiloon now supports IPFS out of the box. It uses, uh, I think last I checked, some components of Iro, if not the full the full package, but might have to make some changes to the changes that Iro made and in, in how they're implementing IPFS. Uh, but that support is already there, and like you, you know, flash your phone with Capulun, and you can on the home screen has a, you know I, IPFS on Wikipedia loaded by default. So, a good another good experimentation pathway for how that might work and what some of the both technical and user experience challenges are. Uh, communicating to users not just in mobile but also on desktop, the trust model of of, of immutable content versus trust this DNS origin is a, a, a challenge, not a problem, but a challenge that we need to solve in a reasonable way from a user communication and a visual design and user experience standpoint. And, and that those challenges exist everywhere. But I think especially on, on mobile where like people are moving, doing transient task work really fast and they don't maybe have the same U, UI affordances that the desktop browser gives you around making trust decisions about what you can or should or shouldn't do or want to or want to not do or the trade-offs in actually loading a page, and trusting it, and giving it input, and things like that. So uh, I think there's a lot of challenges, but also a lot of work happening in that direction too.